and welcome to another episode of the program Improve Seeds on your first agricultural television in the capital city of Abuja, Nigeria. I am Hilda Homsen Frontwam and today we have another interesting topic that is the cultivation of smart dwarf sorghum. I wonder, I know you wonder what it is and if it is real. It's really dwarf, I tell you. And I have an expert, someone that knows so much about it. Mm. He's in the studio here. And when we come back from the break, I will, of course, introduce the person to you and he will highlight, uh, highlight a lot about sorghum. Of course, the dwarf sorghum. Don't go anywhere. He still improves seats on ARCN television. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Before we went on the break, I told you that I have an expert in the house, someone that with great value within the agricultural sector and across the seed sector. He is Dr. Angrawai Ignatius. He is the country representative of Acrisat, and of course, he is the secretary of the steering committee in Nigeria. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much for How having you, me. Sir? Doing okay. Welcome to Abuja. Thank you very much. How's your heat through to you? Uh, we came in yesterday with good rains and uh, I think we didn't experience too much heat. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much, sir. Yeah. Um, what is ACRISAT? ACRISAT is an acronym okay, for International Crop Research Institute for Semi-Arid Tropics. Uh, we have a global headquarter based in India, mm -hmm. as at Hyderabad, Telangana states. Uh, we have, uh, apart from being headquartered in India, we have two uh, sub-regional headquarters in Africa. Uh, we have one in uh, West and Central Africa based in Bamako, Mali, mm -hmm. uh, alongside with six other country offices. Mm -hmm. We have Senegal, Ghana, Niger, uh, and Nigeria. Uh, so operating uh, sites. We have, I come as a country director. Okay. Uh, also in East Africa, we have a regional office based in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, with other country offices in Malawi, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Ethiopia, uh, where also some of the mandate crops are operationalized. Okay. And uh, we run a global mandate in terms of not uh, uh, running it as if it is, but we run a lot of genetic improvement mm -hmm. for sorghum, millet, uh, groundnuts, mm -hmm. chickpea, pigeon pea, and finger millet. Yeah. These are dryland crops. What we mean by dryland crops, these are crops within the areas where the rainfall is limiting uh, between 300 to probably 1,000 millimeter. Uh, which is not sufficient enough to cater for other uh, crops that are uh, of annual in nature, uh, which are heavy uh, water consumers. Mm -hmm. These are light water consumers. Uh, in fact, you can grow millet up to just for 200 millimeter, mm -hmm. but which you cannot grow maize. Mm -hmm. It will require minimum of 800. Mm -hmm. Millet can do on 200 to 250 millimeter. Sogom can do on 300 to 400 uh, uh, as a light water user. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing with groundnut. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, uh, these dry lands have limited uh, rainfall, mm -hmm. uh, poor soil condition, mm -hmm. lot of degraded lands uh, with high temperature, uh, sometimes over 42 degrees centigrade. Which other crops cannot survive other than sorghum or millet? Mm -hmm. Because science and literature have discovered that the only crop, especially with the global warming mm -hmm. and the rise in temperature with the climate change, uh, the likely crops that will survive in this region are sorghum and millet. Because uh, from stimulation mm -hmm. and modeling, we found out that only sorghum and millet can still give seed at 42 degrees centigrade. Uh, which our uh, our region under these uh, dry land conditions are almost reaching to, if the activities that generate 
high temperature that lead to global warming are not controlled. Mm -hmm. And the, most of it are human uh, induced yeah. because we have this gas, uh, flaming gas in the uh, oil industry. We have these uh, air conditions that are using methylene or carbon fluoro uh, hybrid, which uh, like releases uh, carbon dioxide into the ozone that, that form ozone, mm. uh, which deplete the ozone layer. Mm. And this actually gives high uh, UV light penetration from the sun mm. into the earth, uh, which initially is to be covered and uh, like controlled by what you call global blanket, which is the ozone layer. Mm. But with this uh, chlorofluorocarbons, they erode and thin out the uh, ozone, which gives high light, UV light into the atmosphere that generate high heat and the rest uh, a lot of temperature. You find out in some places there is already melting of the ice in the ice countries. Mm -hmm. And then there is overflooding. There is heavy wind storms sometimes. They call it hurricane that even pull down buildings. And uh, in some areas where you used to have nine months or three or six months of rainfall now is shortened to about four months. So, and the place that is worst hit is our dry land because that's where it is within the equator range. Mm. So the up and movement of the sun is along the equator and that is all the countries close to the equator suffers the global warming in particular because that's where the sun is almost directly <laughs> <laughs> but that's the reality that's and the reality. Uh, that's why we have what we call global uh, climate change, change yes. because of global temperature rise oh. Oh. that is great all right so um before you highlighted the challenges that we have now with our global warming we know that um if we set out the different crops that are that made up their mandate how do you monitor some of these to see that they are actually being um, utilized and are being achieved? Like I said, we don't work alone. Okay. Uh, when Ecrisat came to Nigeria, it seeks the permission of the Agri Research Council, okay. who is the interlinkage between the federal government and the research institutes. Okay. So our base was to go through ARCN, who now links up with the national research institute that have a kind of uh, similar crop activity okay. like sorghum, millet, and uh, groundnut. Okay. So only to be discovered that lecture research institute work on mm -hmm. millet based on 1982 national reorganization of the research institute. Okay. Then we have IR uh, Samar okay. that works on sorghum and millet. Uh, uh, sorghum and granite. Okay. So uh, the directors of this research institute were consulted uh, with a visit by the research scientists to now align their uh, activities so that it is not just a research uh, work plan. Okay. It is a joint work plan as supervised by ARCN. And luckily enough, when ICRISA had a kind of break in terms of operation in the country mm -hmm. between 2000 to 2009, there was a recall. And uh, by, by that, uh, when ICRISAT came back in 2010, mm -hmm. there was an MOU developed by ARCN and ICRISAT to now make it stronger linkage mm -hmm. and stronger partnership. Because anything you run without a law guiding you, mm -hmm. anybody can pull out or come in without guide. So that uh, resulted into developing what you call uh, technical uh, steering committee, okay. which has rules and regulation and the terms of reference. Mm -hmm. So this time of reference give ICRISAT opportunity to work with the national research centers mm -hmm. in terms of crop improvement, crop dissemination, and other technologies associated. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we run a breeding program, which is in collaboration with either LCRI or IR. That's why if you see the serial release of LCRI, you find LCICMV watt. 
So mm. that shows lectured ICRISAT collaborative activity mm. that resulted into that. Mm. Then when you come to IR, you find either some knot or some SOG, mm -hmm. which showcase uh, SOGON variety in close collaboration with ICRISAT mm. that was also released on other organizations. Mm -hmm. So that will help us. So what we do is we either jointly develop breeding pipeline with a particular ma uh, market segment mm -hmm. or product profile that will uh, like give what is needed. Mm -hmm. Now in the north, they are looking for short duration mm -hmm. that are early maturing, sure. bold grain. Mm -hmm. This comes up in a planning meeting that look, this is what this extension people brought as a criteria for selecting any product. Mm -hmm. So we go into the product design and then we do run the crosses, then run a kind of nursery. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can generate maybe 2,000 seedlings. Okay. And then after that, we run a nursery, mm -hmm. maybe for a year or two across locations. Then out of series of selection, what we call selection pressure, mm -hmm. we come to about 20 mm -hmm. out of 1,000 or 2,000. So these 20 now go what you call multi-locational trials, mm -hmm. coordinated alongside with the national uh, research centers if it is IR or LCRI. So maybe we take from KB to Maiduguri in the north, mm -hmm. then some places down south like Kaduna, all those Abuja trial sites. Mm -hmm. So because we right now we are running about uh, 15 locations mm -hmm. across those different uh, uh, trial sites. Mm -hmm. We have universities we are collaborating with like ATB, Bauchi, we have a uh, university in Katina and those. So. How we monitor is once this has been satisfactorily tried, mm. we collect data, run analysis, and invite farmers to what we call participatory variety selection. Mm. So alongside with those national uh, partners, whatever they select, we now take it to their farms, okay. what we call on-farm trials. This on-farm trial will be monitored and supervised by National Variety Release Committee, subcroft particularly. Then after that, we now develop a kind of proposal and documentation for release. We now send it through the national, variety, the national institute. We don't release varieties, but we send it either to ICRISAT, mm, yeah. LCRI, or to IR, who now call for a meeting, validate the outcome, and then send it to variety release committee that will now either sit, which sits I think two times a year, so whatever they validate based on presentations and validate the result, because they usually send their people to monitor this thing with the farmers and they bring the report to showcase, yes, the farmers have accepted this, we are there and this is their coming. So that will give a commercial uh, backing of uh, releasing, uh, re registering and releasing the variety. Mm. So that, after that, we now produce what we call early generation seed. Because if you don't have the seed, then what are they going to cultivate? Okay. They don't cultivate the paper. Yeah. So we now generate the seed, which goes to uh, National Agri Seed Council to validate. And then after that, either the seed companies come to collect the breeder seed yeah. for production of foundation seed, and then foundation seed to certify okay. seed. So this is where the community-based seed producers come in because not all the seed companies go either for sorghum, millet, or granite because they are looking for quick commercial crops like rice, maize, and what. So since this is a staple mm. for the communities, because most of the farmers in the north, they don't even produce rice to eat. Mm. They produce rice to sell, yeah. to even go and still buy maize <laughs> or sorghum yeah. or millet. So they are interested in commercial crop, but they still go for that. Yeah. So to make sure that we have a backup mm. of what they eat, apart from growing commercial crops. Mm. This is their food. Mm. So this thing goes into a lot of uh, small-scale seed producers, the community-based seed production. And so what we have done is to train some of this through what we call farmer field schools. Okay. So because we take these varieties, mm. run with the farmers, they make their selection and say this is adaptable to their environment. And based on this food quality, they are interested. So we train them, they produce the seed using the National Agri Seed Council guideline, mm. who also supervise the production of this certified seed from foundation seed, and they sell it within their community. Okay. So after selling within their community, 
they also engage in processing. Mm -hmm. So this is how we run through, because sometimes before they even accept variety, they do what you call organoleptic test. That means the women will get the grain, mm -hmm. process it, mm -hmm. either into kunu or tuo or any other mm -hmm. possible product. Yeah. Once they see the flower yield, the cooking time, the whatever they want to test as product uh, uh, factors for acceptance, because they also want to test oh, how it uh, uh, if you are passing outside. Mm. By the time you are cooking, a nice smelling uh, millet aroma. aroma. Ah, that is the type they want <laughs> because they know that yes, people are eating Indeed. good food there. Wow. So this is the test we go through, and that's the way we monitor progress, uh, and we maybe check after a year or two. Is there any Nature pollution thing. of the seed so that we go back to the drawing board to clean up the uh, seed into purity level of 99%? Because any seed that starts going down into its genetic purity, mm. it will start losing viability and the economic return to whatever investment you make. Mm. So those are the things that uh, we mm -hmm. do. You've heard it. He has elaborated a lot about the processes at the monitoring. It's a long and it's a step-by-step -step process that everybody put it or her heads on the deck to see that they have qualified and purified seeds. We'll go on a short break. When we come back, we'll talk now about the dwarf circuit. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Your first agricultural television in the capital city of Abuja, Nigeria. And we're talking with an expert, the country rep of Ikrisat, Dr. Angarawai Ignatius. And he has highlighted a lot about everything. So right now we're going to talk about smart dwarf sorghum. Due to insecurity, sir, what is smart dwarf sorghum? Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, inquisitive question. Yeah. And it is... Uh, very interesting one because uh, when we saw the need to uh, take sorghum uh, other than just using a cutlass mm. and hoe to harvest, we felt we can think of uh, combined harvesting sorghum. Mm. But there is a certain request for dwarf, uh, for height, mm. when you are going to use the combined harvester. You know, you, you do combine harvester for wheat, do combine harvester right. for millet, I mean, for rice. Yes. Yeah, even for millet, yes. because I saw it in the U.S. where uh, a combined harvester was harvesting millet. millet. Right there uh, it, in Tipton, Georgia, mm -hmm. you find a big land, uh, a combined harvester will cut the head, stretch the panicles, bag it, and just ready to take to the store at a particular uh, moisture percentage. So we felt uh, expanding the uses of sorghum in industries, mm. producing malt, producing bread, producing flour, and all kinds of snacks, we felt we can expand sorghum production, especially uh, where we have large scale farmers okay. by uh, developing short varieties that will meet the criteria for combined harvester. Fortunately, uh, how it fell in the line is it coincided with the security challenges in the country where some of the sorghum uh, usual farmers were banned from okay. using tall sorghum. Yeah. Because most of the sorghum in Nigeria are uh, more than two meters uh, yeah. tall. And so in the rainy season, you hardly can see the next, uh, the next two <laughs> kilometers from your uh, frontage. And that's where the invaders mm. take advantage, especially in the rainy season, to uh, displace communities. And uh, so we took it as a challenge that, look, this is a way out, especially in the insurgency uh, areas where the security agent felt tall sorghum inhibits visibility. Mm. So what can we do? So we introduced to some communities, mm -hmm. and they can see their houses, neighbors, far and near, and the, the sorghums are also giving them maybe more than what the tall sorghum we are giving. Yeah. Uh, you, you can see one of the examples where yeah. you see people standing taller than the sorghum, yeah. and even their houses are uh, taller, taller than, than the, the crop. crops. So uh, I know of a particular village where we went, they said, at least you have brought us 
something that we can now grow along with our cowpea, along with our granite, because number one, it is dwarf. dwarf yeah. It doesn't hinder security visibility. Number two, it gives better uh, agro uh, practices in terms of uh, crop combination, mixed cropping. Okay. You can have either two rows or three rows of this sorghum and maybe one or two rows of groundnut mm. uh, with good uh, uh, sunshine so that there is no shading yes. effect. Yes. So agronomically, it was good uh, for combined cropping or mixed cropping. Mm -hmm. Then one good thing is that you don't need to use your cutlass to, to cut. cut. Right, you can cut the heads as you are standing, which is a difficult challenge for women Sometimes they have to bend with their babies at the back to cut the head. Now you can cut well; it is standing. Mm. So that reduces, that gives women opportunity to also engage in, the, in, harvesting. in harvesting the product. Other than they have to have a crying baby when you are cutting <laughs> the growth. Yeah. Then, after maybe three weeks, if they still moisture, this sprouts to give more leaves mm. for uh, stover to the animals. animals. So. Uh, and then that actually has reduced the challenge of not having either sorghum or millet in their diet, which initially they were inhabited. So what you can do here is you increase the population. You know, you, our people plant sorghum one meter by one meter. Mm. But this, you can plant 30 cm, mm. and that gives you maybe a population of about 666,000 plants, okay. other than 333,000 plants. Then there's no shading effect if mm. you are growing your cow or mm. uh, uh, groundnut and uh, even soybean. Mm. Uh, apart from that, it gives you higher biomass as a return to livestock uh, feeds. Yes. Uh, then it, one good thing again, it has uh, iron and zinc mm. that is also nutritionally balanced for use. Uh, it matures early. Okay. It takes about uh, 65 days from planting to harvest. 65 days? Yeah. And on all soil, oh, there are some particular soil that farmers... I'm coming to that. Okay. That's why it takes 85 Five to 90 days, days. Okay. which is drought tolerant in, in some aspect. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is actually adaptable to... You can plant it in the south, but you have to find a shade where you dry it at uh, maturity because okay. it is not photoperiod sensitive, whereby it will wait until maybe October before it starts flowering. Okay. If you plant it now, just count 80 days, mm. you are ready to harvest. Wow. So in that, it is done mostly in the Sahel okay. or Sudan environment where the rain runs maybe by end of September is off. Mm. So it matures and you have clean white grain because that's the far, far uh, aspect of it. Mm. We have actually the Doro as, uh, the, the, red. the red aspect. Okay. Uh, but this is one that Farmers just felt this is where you know, they want. this goes for a lot, for kunu, for... All kinds for of all kinds. recipes. Yes. Yeah, yes. for sorghum. Yes. Oh, wow. So, um, sir, this is interesting. I'm sure and it requires less fertilizer as compared mm -hmm. to the tall so, crop that have to spend a lot of nitrogen in building the stock yes. before it goes to sink. Mm -hmm. So this one is short. Uh, the roots are also very deep to extract water. Uh, it does it well on sandy, uh, clay loam. Okay. Uh, and in fact, it can grow where millet also can grow because it is early maturing. Yeah. So when you are harvesting millet, you can also harvest at the same time. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, sir, how do our farmers get? Yes, that is one thing like we have said. We do what we call community-based production okay. using the farmer field school approach. Okay. We have taken this variety to some locations okay. and uh, what we do is from the planting to harvest, okay. we have a group of people we call community farmers. So this uh, run like a school where we plant it with the, on their fields. Okay. They monitor its growth, development, and right from seedling, they begin to discover the characteristics of this crop. Okay. And then we allow them to make selection by themselves. So we also demonstrate this along the road, whereby passerby will now identify, hey, who are the people controlling this? Who are the people farming this? We want seed. So we now encourage the community-based seed producers to produce it because they have many customers. Yeah. 
Even in some places where we tested in Kano, it is hidden, but farmers find their way to look at that because they felt they have never seen a crop that is shorter than their knee yes. and is still producing. Uh, so I see they are all standing above it. <laughs> yes. So in the, and, uh, we have actually designated places where the farmers are like source of the seeds to the communities. All right. So places them. like apart, it's just within Kano? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, we have this. In Jigawa, we have this in uh, some places in Sokoto, we have this in uh, places like uh, Bauchi. Okay. So, yeah, there are a lot of. Uh, and so, we we'll go to seed companies and demand for this. Uh, there is right now a seed company that have come all the way from Yobe to book for the breeder seed so that you can go and multiply for foundation seed and then the certified seed. Now, uh, sir, from in, in case, for instance, farmers that uh, have the advantage of getting it, can they reproduce from the, from the uh, one thing with, one, for Sorry the for interrogation. Yeah. One thing with sorghum, yeah. it is about 99, 95% self. Okay. So uh, the production can last for, you can run a seed for two years without much pol uh, pollution. But okay. one thing that uh, that 5% can do is why we call for isolation in terms of seed production. Okay. So that isolation takes care of the tendency of that 5% outcrossing to cross when they are at maturing stage. Mm -hmm. So we do what we call isolation by time, okay. whereby, because this is early, if you plant it early for seed, mm -hmm. you will harvest when others have not started booting. Mm -hmm. wow. So <laughs> that can keep the seed purity. That's why we train people to really go into speciality of seed production, not just grain production. Because if you continue using it for grain, I remember a place I went, the seed was 10 years old, and the man was surprised. How did I know? I said yes, because each year, this is the percentage pollution, and it has reached this stage. So by my calculation, you have <laughs> used this seed for 10 years. And exactly the day, the time we release and send it to farmers, he calculated it was 10 years. He said, who told you? I said, we are the one that work on it. So it's not a new thing for us to know. Yeah. So once you start having different heights, different grain color, that means another cut pollinated it and then there's already a segregation or impurity coming in and that at that stage, we either tell them to rock or discard and get new product. So how I wish we could talk, could talk, could talk, because it's really interesting. I'm sure a lot of our farmers will want you to talk more. I hope when we come knocking at your door anytime, you, you listen to us. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and in fact, this is the household for Ikrisat. Yes. Uh, that's where we are. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> he did mention that there's opportunity for us to at least have an office yeah. when we come here. We'll be able to run some activities together mm -hmm. and uh, see what we can get out of it. So uh, we'll be happy to at least contribute to see what we can also deliver and how we can create awareness of what is happening so that at least the little, little knowledge that we have, we can share uh, across the community. Thank you so much. I'm Thank very grateful. Thank you for finding time here. Thank you for having me. If you want to know more, I'm sure you'll say, why now? Just watch our YouTube it will be there live. I will get more information to, of course, add to food security in Nigeria. And all hands must be on deck. We have smart dwarf soggy. Go for it and have better yielding for your soggy. And for all farmers, this is the right channel for you to be informed and educated about improved varieties of our crops. Keep a date with us next time for another episode of the program. I am Hilda Hobson. I'm saying take good care of yourself. And thank you so much again, Doctor, for being here. Thank you very much. All right. Bye for now.